Yeah, good evening. Welcome to the April session of uh, Virtual Tumor Board. We are, uh, are very excited. We have an excellent panel tonight, and our topic is melanoma. My name is Bob Akibi. Greetings from uh, New York City. It's a kind of a colder uh, spring day here in New York City, and it's a little bit overcast, but uh, I hope you're doing well wherever you are. Our panel today are Dr. Jessica Yusensky from Indiana University, Dr. Ryan Gepfers from MD Anderson, and Dr. Caitlin McMullen from Moffitt Cancer Center. Our expert discussion have really don't need no introduction. Dr. Randy Weber from MD Anderson and Dr. Carol Bradford from The Ohio State. She will be joining at about 7.15. And Dr. Nikhil Kushalani from <coughs> Moffitt will be our medical oncologist. We also have on the call Dr. Susan McCammon, Dr. Tricia Shamalbeck, Michael Moore, and TJ Al, and I see uh, my friend, Dr. Uh, Jeff Liu. All right, let's get us started. Jessica, you want to go first? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And... Okay. All right. Um, so my name is Jessica Yusensky. I am from Indiana University, and um, I have this uh, this patient that we had. Um, it's a 79 year old female who presented with um, already had a uh, shade biopsy of a cutaneous melanoma of the right cheek. Per the PATH report that uh, came with her, she had. A uh, 1.2 millimeter depth, uh, it was positive at the deep margin, uh, as well as the peripheral margins, uh, noted to have ulceration and a mitosis of four. Um, she had this lesion for about six months, um, progressively getting a little bit bigger over that time. She denied any bleeding of the lesion, no neck or, uh, or cheek masses, no facial weakness. Um, she did not have any uh, personal history or family history of melanoma. Her past medical history was uh, significant just for uh, peripheral vascular disease, um, uh, CHF and a, and a, a pacemaker, um, and was a non-smoker. Um, on exam, she was a robust 79 year old, um, so she was not frail. Uh, she had about a one centimeter pink papule along the right zygoma. It was mobile to the underlying tissue. Uh, on exam, uh, you cannot palpate any parotid or cervical um, adenopathy and mm -hmm. her facial nerve was intact. And so okay. this is a picture of the, the lesion. Perfect. So let's just start with one second. Um, Dr. Weber, I, all of us, we see a lot of these people who come in from other places and they have these shave biopsies. Now, this, you look at this 1.2 millimeter. Do you believe that? Do you repeat the biopsy routinely? What would you do for people who come in with a biopsy already and it's a shave biopsy? Uh, yeah, with the sh a lot of these do get shaved, unfortunately. So you don't know the exact depth of invasion. <clears throat> It's a big enough lesion that you could do a two millimeter full thickness punch biopsy. Um, I'm not sure it would change my management that much. Uh, so um, probably go with what we have. Okay. Obviously, and, it, has and a it, it has a vertical growth phase uh, yeah. predominantly. And, and what would you like to see in the pathology report? What is it that... Um you want the pathologist to report to you for every melanoma case? Well, we use a synoptic path report. So it's um, obviously the uh, thickness, um, whether you see any uh, regression, lymphocytic infiltration, mitotic figures, ulceration. Um, I'm sure I'm Do you gonna... routinely ask for BRAF? Uh, yeah, we do. Um, if, uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, and they can do that typically. Yeah. Okay. Very good. And Dr. Kushalani, I see that you joined. Thank you. What would you like to know in a melanoma report? Um, so I agree with what has already been said. Um, I'm not sure that I would necessarily do a BRAF at this point in time without knowing the true pathologic stage of the disease, because often with BRAF, Pyro sequencing, we may get pushback from uh, pairs in terms of coverage. Now, one could certainly do an immunohistochemistry. That's easy enough for the pathologist to do. But then you have to recall that that 
IHC is very specific only for BRAF V600E. So if yeah. it is negative, it does not exclude V600K, V600R, um, and the other variants. See? So that doesn't Excellent mean point. you'll have to repeat that by pyrosequencing. And again, at this point in time, it does not influence your management. Too. Okay, very good. Thanks. Uh, Jessica, continue. Okay. Um, so with that information, um, in terms of the next steps with um, imaging and her uh, surgery, we did not have any, um, we did not have any imaging prior to, she was clinically mm -hmm. N0, so we did not um, pursue any imaging because of that reason. And okay. um, for surgery, we offered her a wide local excision with a sentinel node uh, biopsy. Okay, let's ask the panel. Uh, Dr. Uh, Shamalbeck, do you do, so if you go back, can you go back to the image? Yep. That's clinical pictures. What do you think? Should we get imaging routinely for these folks? So if you read the NCCM guidelines for early stage, you would only image um, in a very focused way uh, based on your review of systems, keeping in mind that these could metastasize anywhere. This does seem, I imagine on clinical exam, it was localized N0. Um, and so I think it is reasonable to go um, to sentinel lymph node biopsy and wide local excision. Candidly, the majority of these do come to me already with some type of imaging. Um, I think where potentially I, I do alter my practice, and again, it's a little bit of an audible call, is if I have an older patient who isn't going to go on to get completion neck dissection, isn't interested in sentinel node, that is a person that I'll have a lower threshold for getting an, a baseline ultrasound. Okay. Dr. Weber, what would you do? CT scan, PET, MRI, no imaging? Uh, I would do an ultrasound for sure, um, I would, and I would be examining the parotid basin and uh, mm -hmm. the upper neck. Uh, and the reason I would do it, if if there is a suspicious lymph node and the FNA is positive, you can skip the lymphatic mapping at that point. Sure. Let me ask one more uh, opinion. Uh, Dr. McCammon, what would you do in Alabama? Would you routinely get CT, CT or any imaging before these kind of... Uh, Local monoma. <clears throat> I uh, I think that I would do um, in office ultrasound, mm -hmm. um, but I would have a low threshold for getting a CT. It's relatively easy, um, mm -hmm. but I would start with ultrasound. Okay, and I guess we all agree that it would be uh, void local excision plus sentinel nodes. Uh, Dr. Weber. Yeah, I agree with that. And is there any situation that you wouldn't do central node for, for a node negative uh, thin melanoma or you know, this kind of lesion? Uh, you, you know, if it's, if it's a very thin melanoma um, and it doesn't have any adverse features, uh, probably not. Okay. And by thin, I mean less than 0.75 millimeter. Sure. And just getting to the nitty gritty, this woman, I think if we get a one centimeter or five millimeter margin, you probably need some rotation, some sort of a reconstruction. What's your routine? Do you do two a stage? Make sure you get all the, uh, the uh, margins negative and the central node before reconstruction or and then the answer you do one a stage surgery. Uh, if you're asking me, we I would typically do a two stage. Two a stage, the okay. Station, the central node and then bring her back for a reconstruction. Okay. And possibly a lymphadenectomy, but uh, stage the primary repair. TJ, you're up in the Bronx. Uh, what would you do? You do two, uh, two a stage or one a stage? Yeah, I do two stages. I don't argue with Dr. Weber. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Cecilia, you agree? Two a stage or one a stage? Two stage. Okay, uh, very good. Uh, Jessica, tell us uh, what did you do and how did you decide? Yes, so um, also to stage. Um, so we did um, the uh, wide local excision with the Sentinel. She had uh, two nodes that, um, that were there, one in the teleparotid and one in um, the cervical uh, lymph, lymph node basin in level three. And her pathology came back with um, superficial spreading with nodular component, a thickness of 5.7 millimeters, ulceration, mitosis of four, 
no uh, microsatellites, present LVI and um, PNI, uh, no regression or um, uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. Margins were negative, uh, but one of the two sentinel nodes were positive, and the BRAF and NRAFs were both negative. Perfect. Great. Okay. So uh, before we go to this, uh, um, Dr. Weber, is there anything else that you would like to know to see in this pathology report? Is there any other points that we need to pay attention to? Uh, no, this looks pretty complete to me. I don't think okay. there's any other information that would be actionable. Do, do you care about like what's the closest margin? One state's a neg negative margin? Uh, typically, we would get that information, yeah. We would, okay. yeah. And Dr. Kushalani, is there anything from medical oncology standpoint when you have this that you would think that it will help the management? Um, no, nothing else about apart from what's already done. But uh, when you say BRAF and RAS negative, I assume that's by pyro sequencing, correct? Yes, sir. yeah. All right, yep. Okay. Um, okay, so what to do next? Uh, we have the, uh, can we have the sentinel lymph node tumor burden? Um, okay. I, yes, that, that was not reported in the path. Uh, Do you routinely get that, that, Ryan? Every time. I yes. think that it would help me decide the next step. We know that there's a, a positive lymph node, but we don't know whether that's through PCR, or there's a few cells, or we don't have imaging, there could be a you know, a 10 millimeter focus of tumor there. It helps me decide whether I'm worried about non-sentinel lymph nodes. And what, what would you get in your pathology? What do you get that it's, uh, it's a PCR? Uh, a How do they report it? A quantification and a location, whether it's subcapsular oh, or oh, oh, a measurement. Okay. Oh, okay. Very good. Um, JJ, can you please mute? Okay, all right. Um, so we got one out of two. Yep. Now, I guess you brought the, the, the pertinent questions. Both of us asked the panel. Um, Dr. Uh, Jeff, Jeff Liu, what would you do? The patient now has stage three disease with a positive yeah. sentinel lymph node. Um, and so at this point, I would, do, I would recommend getting a workup, which in our team would be a PET CT scan and MRI for evaluation for distant disease and an MRI that's routinely done for when we have a positive disease like this to look to for, for any other disease. And then depending on the extent of disease, we would uh, figure out what we wanted to do next. So if it was only local regionally advanced, well, I should say you have a positive central lymph node, there's no other disease picked up on PET CT versus MRI the patient will be getting adjuvant immunotherapy. The question is with or without completion neck dissection um, mm -hmm. or completion lymphadenectomy, I should say. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the point of discussion. So at this point, you don't do automatically, yeah. okay, you got positive central node, parotid neck, followed <laughs> by RT, then, then- That's a good question. Moderate. So I think Dr. Gepfer's comments were, were well done. I think in our team, sometimes you see these like tiny subcapsular cells where it's like literally like 10 cells that lit up an IHC. And then the team has a whole discussion of whether the value of completion uh, dissection would be valuable versus just straight up IO. Um, if there's sort of extra nodal extension, if there's like a real uh, designated focus of disease that's like, you know, a couple millimeters, then I, I feel strongly about, I, I feel, feel highly more favorable for completion nodal dissection to try to achieve a regional or better regional control uh, as pointed out in MSLT2. Perfect. Okay, well, I see Dr. Bradford joined us Dr. Gratzel, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. I don't know how you, uh, you're doing all this, being the Dean of Ohio State and joining the tumor board. Thank you so much. So quick question, patient, uh, can you go back to the pathology report, um, Jessica? Yep. Patient had a complete excision, 5.7 millimeter, one positive central node. Uh, what would you do at this point now? Do you continue with, um, completion, lymphadenectomy, or you go to more toward the uh, immunotherapy route or radiation even. Right, so um, of course, based upon the result of MSLT2, we learned that um, if we do a regional uh, therapeutic lymph node dissection, um, that that does offer um, slightly better regional control, but does not offer a, a, an improved um, ability to survive. So it's, it's kind of regional control versus um, longevity. And so what I would really do is 
um, do the um, screening for distant metastatic disease mm -hmm. that Dr. Liu described. And then it's really a discussion with the patient. I would also ask at your respective <clears throat> institution, are there any open clinical trials? And mm -hmm. does that clinical trial require next staging uh, for eligibility? But it really is a choice. And, and again, I would also ask the patient to consult with the medical oncologist. Our medical, the reality is it used to be that we dissected all, everybody got a neck dissection. Now the pendulum, I think, in many institutions is swinging back towards uh, consultation with a medical oncologist uh, with offers of immunotherapy versus clinical trials, standard care versus clinical trials. And you haven't really lost anything. You can always um, you know, dissect uh, the neck later, but it always, as in all cases, it's a robust discussion with patient uh, and family about goals for care. Thanks. Uh, I just finished Wexmed Live, so sorry, to, hey. I had to sign on a few minutes late. Okay, no problem. Dr. Weber, how would you um, consult this patient and how is the treatment now nowadays at MDM? Yeah, well, you know, she's advanced age, even though her performance status is good. And uh, I, I agree with what Dr. Bradford said. Those are the options. Um, immunotherapy in this age group, I'd like to hear from medical oncologists, but it, it, it's not always innocuous. Mm -hmm. So um, clearly th this patient could just undergo observation as well. There would be a consideration for immunotherapy. I wouldn't advise radiation. I think that's overkill for her stage of disease. Proceeding with a therapeutic dissection, it's a pretty extensive operation. You're going to have to do a prodidectomy, and uh, I would do a one to five neck dissection if I was going to operate on her. So I think that's over treatment given the MSLT2 trial data. Very good. So, Dr. Kushalani, what would you recommend if this patient comes to you? So, let's say Jessica, finish with the operation and send the patient to you. I would directly consider systemic therapy for this patient. I would strongly argue against um, proceeding with a neck node dissection. I see no therapeutic value. I'm not sure at this point what this adds. I think we have large randomized trials that have not clearly demonstrated any uh, improvement in survivorship. You have MSLT2, mm -hmm. you have the DCOG trial. Um, and, you know, I think the there are selected circumstances that I think, I believe you could probably count on your fingers in terms of which of these patients need a therapeutic dissection. And those are probably the ones with multiple positive central nodes. Even in that situation, one could make the argument that their risk for systemic recurrence is so high that they should directly proceed to systemic therapy rather than regional therapy. Um, so I would, at least at our institution, um, these patients, of course, the head and neck patients are divided both between head and neck oncology with Dr. McMullen and her team, mm -hmm. um, as well as with our plastic surgeons. And I can pretty much tell you that uh, virtually none of these patients will get a completion uh, node dissection. This is somebody I would directly offer adjuvant anti-PD-1 <laughs> monotherapy for one year, uh, because based on the available information, this is high-risk stage 3C disease. Um, okay. T4B and 1A. And I would anticipate that the risk of recurrence in the absence of any further therapy here would be in the order of 50 to 60% over the next five years. And that could okay. be both regional as well as distant recurrence. Perfect. All right. So you have one more minute to finish this case. Thank you. That sure. was perfect. Um, Jessica, tell us how, what did you decide and how did you manage the patient? Yes, so she ended up getting, um, we closed the defect site um, with a cervical facial advancement flap and she went on to uh, immunotherapy. She um, is just over a year now out uh, after completion with no evidence of disease. Okay, perfect. Excellent case. Um, any last comments? So let me push back, Dr. Pushlani, on your. So on the MSLT2, there was a what, 12%, 30% higher. Local regional failure and local regional failure in the neck and the parotid is not very pretty. Um, and you know, there are some surgeons here can do a parotid in 45 minutes and with no complication. I, I'm, not, I'm not questioning the, the complexity or the simplicity of surgery. I think what I'm questioning is in today's day and age of adjuvant immunotherapy, which is far better compared to when MSLT2 
was actually conducted, we really did not have very good adjuvant treatment. So I think we are curing more patients in the stage three setting here with systemic agents. I do believe, and very appropriately, the comment was made that this is not trivial. Toxicity with immunotherapy can be long lasting as well. So I think we have to weigh the pros and cons of that. But a lot of these patients can be surgically salvaged later when you have a recurrence in the nodal basin as well. Okay, perfect. All right, let's have uh, Dr. Deptford. Ryan, you ready to uh, present? Perfect, excellent case. Thank you so much, Jessica, and thanks to all the commentators. Okay, can you see my screen? Yeah. I'm at the end of there. Disregard all the things you just saw. Okay. okay thanks for thanks for the invitation. This is great. I think um, clearly Dr. Weber is a great mentor of mine. I think I saw Dr. Wong on here, who was a, my melanoma mentor, among other things, in residency. It's a it's a, an honor for me to present this patient. Um, I tried to select a case that would highlight some other difficult considerations apart from uh, what the other presenters were choosing. This is a 39 year old gentleman comes in with a neck mass. He comes here with a prior history of a melanoma on his scalp. Uh, he had that treated uh, with a wide local excision, skin graft, and a sentinel node biopsy about nine months prior. I'll get to that path uh, in a minute. He does have a history that's most notably significant for a renal transplant. This was from a family history of uh, cystic disease or something like that. He uses chewing tobacco um, and he's on some uh, medications for his diabetes and for his for his transplant. This is him when I see him on exam. Um, and I can stop there, Bob, if you want. To yeah. What's going on? Well, that's obviously you can't even see where the lesion is. Um, okay. Um, so um, this let's, was, let's just stop right there for a second. So, oh, you have the biopsy? So, yeah, this was his prior biopsy path. Okay. This, this is, is the original. Path, original surgery path uh, from his scalp and sentinel node biopsy. Okay, so back then, he had what, 6.3 millimeter and uh, was no alteration, no alteration, no paranormal um, invasion. He had negative margins by our review, and he had one out of one mm -hmm. sentinel node biopsy positive with a small I focus think. of disease. And how long ago was that? That was about nine months prior to me. Nine months ago. Okay. All right. I'm very, first of all, I'm glad that you brought a transplant patient. Now, good luck with the immunotherapy on that one. Okay. Um, so, Dr. Bradford, um, can you go Tell back to the clinical image? <laughs> so, so, what happened? So, nine months ago, he had that wide excision of scalp and a positive sentinel node. Obviously, um, that treatment was not concluded if he didn't have any adjuvant therapy or any regional neck dissection. So what happened nine months ago after that? I, I thought sentinel node was negative, correct? Sentinel node was positive. It oh, was, was positive. Um, you know, less than 0.1 millimeter of disease. Um, and he was observed after that. Uh, okay. Got it. Okay, thank you. So, um, and did you biopsy these? Yes, we biopsied to confirm that this was indeed the current melanoma. Okay. Um, Dr. Bradford, how would you consult this patient now? <laughs> so um, patient, obviously, I mean, and, and this is a, I think we all have taken care of patients who are immunosuppressed. Mm -hmm. uh, we need our immune system for cancer surveillance. So um, uh, this, you know, it, it, it is a higher risk patient just because of the immunosuppression. So he appears to have, of course, we want to biopsy a marginal recurrence as, as well as really an extensive uh, regional recurrence. And it looks like it may be at the site of exact site of the sentinel lymph node biopsy. Um, first thing is, cause I see the little um, uh, scar there, I believe. Um, yeah. First thing is uh, absolutely needs a full metastatic workup that can be MRI brain with contrast, uh, as mm -hmm. well as a whole body PET CT. I would also, um, you know, 
maybe it's a little old school, but LDH uh, in the blood test as well, because you really want to do a thorough a metastatic workup um, uh, is the first thing. And then uh, we, we yeah. need the staging to figure out what next. Sure. Um, Dr. Weber, do you, for these advanced cases, do you routinely get an MRI plus a PET? What, what would you do for image? I guess Dr. Bradford mentioned that the apps, you know, systemic treatment is no question. Uh, <laughs> staging. Yeah, I think you need an MRI of the brain for sure. PET scan will determine if there are other distant metastasis. If, if I'm planning surgery, I'm going to get anatomic imaging as well. We don't mm -hmm. uh, do uh, CT contrast and PET in the same study. So I'd probably order a head and neck CT scan as well as the uh, PET CT. Okay. Okay. I guess that's, uh, we all agree that that would be the minimum. Um, Dr. Kushalani, what, would, what is your routine for people coming with advanced or different scenarios for? No, exactly the same thing as uh, folks have already mentioned. Okay. You know, I still um, have no objection. In this case, probably not, given the location of the tumor. But in tumors that are non-head and neck related, I would have no objections just getting a good contrast enhanced CT imaging of the torso. Um, I don't think everyone necessarily requires a PET, as many of you, again, mm -hmm. we get tremendous pushback again from third-party payers for that. Yeah. Okay, very good. All right, Ryan, what, tell us uh, what happened next. Sure. Uh, so this is our path. Um, I didn't mean for this to be out of order, but before he came to us, this was the history. He had um, developed these, these sites, was given some antibiotics, which did not help. He actually had a BRAF mutation. Uh, this is not an actionable one, but he was started on uh, BRAF and MEK inhibition, and the uh, tumor continued to grow rapidly. That's when then when they saw him. This was okay. his imaging as described. He did have an MRI brain as well as this PET scan, and the purpose of this was to demonstrate that he had uh, obviously the site on the on the scalp as well as uh, multifocal disease in the right neck. Okay. Let me ask you a quick question, Dr. Kushalani. No, Before you start sorafenib uh, or any other BRAF, would you like to know, if they say BRAF positive, do you actually ask them to tell you the exact mutation? Yes. I mean, in, in today's day and age, I think we're obliged to do that. I think previously when we had Sanger sequencing, we simply just knew whether it was BRAF, B600 and nothing else. Um, but I think in today's day and age and the availability of next generation sequencing, I think we owe it to our patients to actually decipher this because there are three types of BRAF mutations, class one, class two, and class three. And you want to make sure that the type of mutation that is actionable, typically the class one mutations are the true oncogenic drivers of the tumor. And those are the ones um, that um, result in downstream phosphorylation. The kinase dead mutations do not respond to MAP kinase targeted therapy. So for this case, if you had seen that, you wouldn't even consider it a BRAF inhibitors? If I had because seen what? The, uh, the mutation that Ryan mentioned, it's the uh, BRAF uh, 500, what was it? I think it was a 594. I believe that is a class two and there may be potential for response. If it's maybe. a class three uh -huh. mutation, for example, a 466, those typically do not respond at all. Some of the class two mutations may respond just to MEK inhibition and not to combination BRAF. The BRAF inhibitor may not play any role in... Uh, inactivation of the activated protein there. Great, so, um, and Brian, I assume this is the, the only focus of the disease in your PET and imaging. That's correct. He has no other okay. types of disease beyond these areas. Okay, I see Dr. Uh, Steve Wong is also on. Uh, Dr. Wong, are you available to make a comment? Uh, what would you do for this case? All right. Okay, let's ask, uh, Dr. Shamalbeck, tiny little tumor, you can't even see it. Yeah, so obviously this is a, an exceedingly challenging case, but a great one to discuss. I, I, th I think you um, need to, to look at the overall picture and what the goals are. So we know he's a transplant patient. I just wanna um, echo what Dr. Weber put in the chat. You have to reach out to the transplant team, ensure that they're aware of this recurrence and that the immunosuppression is modulated uh, to the best of their ability. I don't have all the cuts. Uh, I'm going to assume, let, let's assume, uh, and please, uh, Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong, if it's resectable, you, you know, 
surgery is only going to give you local control. He already failed surgery with negative margins. So I, I don't think it's realistic to think surgery alone is going to cure him this time. And this is exceedingly extensive dermal involvement. And that's where I do lean heavily upon our multidisciplinary um, tumor board. He already failed um, some systemic therapy, um, hasn't seen radiation, but again, I, I don't know that that's curative. The only other thing that I want to point out, if I'm remembering correctly, he's a renal transplant patient. Renal transplant. And, and out of the gate, you know, it is important, especially for fellows and if they're residents on the call to understand that traditionally PD-1 inhibitors um, are, they're not, actually not FDA approved right now for our transplant patients. So those individuals are not included in the original clinical trials because the quoted rate of fulminant rejection was 50% out of the gate. We, there are some smaller trials that are talking about, um, uh, you know, having some success in what, you know, it, it's different if it's liver or lung or heart where there's no backup for kidney, there is dialysis, though I always want to acknowledge mm -hmm. there are many dialysis patients that would rather die than go back on to that, mm -hmm. you know, three day a week treatment. Uh, and again, I think looking at clinical trials and additional sequencing mm -hmm. becomes imperative in this because then in my hands, this, a knife alone is not going to do it. Okay, very good. So, um, I mean, I'm a, you know, you're a three flat surgeon, I'm a three flat surgeon, I'm looking at it, like, yes, it's going to be a big hole, but, you know, put an ALT. All right. Um, so great points. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Weber, as you mentioned that you would talk to the transplant. What would you ask them? Yeah, I would ask them if there's uh, any way to uh, back off on the immunosuppressive therapy. Um, that may uh, give you some advantages uh, as you try to gain local regional control of this. But uh, yeah, this is this would be an extensive operation and surgery alone is not going to control this. So you have to think of other options as well. Mm -hmm. And what are the options? Um, what would you think that um, any, any, what can we do? Should we try immunotherapy and just, you know what, you're going to lose the kidney, so be it, but you're going to save it. Yeah, I'd have to defer to the medical oncologist. Yeah, on that. okay. But, uh, radiation, um, I think uh, it clearly has a role here and it will uh -huh. give you some enhanced uh, regional control and local control. Okay. Um, Dr. Bratchett, what would you tell the patient? What would you? Yeah, so um, I, I, uh, fabulous comments by all the colleagues. Um, you know, this is advanced disease, the immunosuppression. I agree with calling the transplant surgeon I would definitely consult with our um, expert medical oncologist. Um, so it's a, a quick recurrence, it's rapidly growing. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and though we don't yet see distant metastatic disease, it would be quite unusual for that not mm -hmm. to be present at this time. It's just not yet visible. I, I guess it could be, but you know, um, uh, melanoma of all diseases is very, very prone to distant metastatic disease. So, you know, I think it's important to discuss the goals of treatment. Um, you know, uh, regional control, this is a place where regional control will be important for quality of life. I do think one does have to have an honest discussion about what those treatment options really are. You know, immunotherapy has been so transformative for patients with all stages really of melanoma, except very early. Um, but it, it may really not work uh, in this case um, because of the transplant. So I think, and again, and maybe one yeah. option is to, you know, sacrifice the kidney and, you know, and, and, you know, stop, you know, stop immunosuppression and even consider uh, immunotherapy. But I think it's a really complex discussion. This is where we need multidisciplinary sure. teams to have a conversation about, you know, all the various treatment options and then what is the patient's goal of care. Okay, so Dr. Kushalani, classic case. Surgeon saying, all right, it's too big. Uh, well, we so I, I think I there are a couple of ways. Big. <laughs> <laughs> I was surprised that I had an ex-surgeonist saying too big. I didn't say but that. in any event, um, I think I think there are two approaches here. The multi-D cannot be stressed enough. I think someone put 
Uh, you broke up for a second. He, he broke up and froze. I think your upfront okay. approach here can okay. certainly be combination chemo radiotherapy using uh -huh. a, um, a regimen such as carboplatin plus paclitaxel along with radiation. And again, that's uh -huh. purely for palliation. It yeah. is not going to be curative. The patient needs to understand that. Yeah. Um, one could make the argument they could drop the tacrolimus, which is a calcineurin inhibitor, and mm -hmm. potentially try to rescue the, the allograft with uh, um, mycophenolate or other similar drugs or mm -hmm. mTOR inhibitors. So those would be approaches that uh, patients could certainly uh, be offered. Um, the, the, the question of anti-PD-1 therapy is certainly a tougher one. And I agree with the comment earlier, I quote patients a 50% failure of the allograft risk. And I tend to back into um, the use of anti-PD-1 agents outside of a clinical trial in patients like this, because I've seen a patient lose his kidney, uh, okay. his kidney transplant and go back on dialysis. And certainly it's not fun. So I think um, in those cases, one also has to recognize that it's quite possible that the responses to anti-PD-1 therapy may certainly not be as robust as we yeah. typically see in the non-immunosuppressed population. There could be an argument made to use anti-CTLA-4 alone in this patient that potentially has a lower risk of transplant rejection, even though it has a lower risk of uh, response as well. Respond. If somebody responds right. to ipilimumab, they can respond for a very long time. So yeah. it's a okay, complex so decision-making process. Sorry, we have three minutes to finish this. A uh, quick question for you, Dr. Pesnoy. Quick yes, no. Would you do a next, uh, next uh, generation sequencing for these cases? Um, okay, you're, okay, Ryan, let's go. We've got two minutes to finish this case. So we discussed all these things. That was a really nice uh, um, discussion. We quoted him, this was in 2018, about 40 to 70% that we would reject his kidney with PD-1 therapy. The only thing that wasn't mentioned was TVEC injections, which we thought were not likely to control such extensive disease. Um, we did give him um, a combination of ipv neva We had these discussions with him uh, about rejecting his graft. Um, we gave him two doses of it, and sure enough, uh, the disease appears to be getting larger, and his graft is experiencing some acute uh, rejection as evidenced by this subsequent PET scan. Um, this was him, uh, me seeing him in my clinic uh, prior to the first planned surgery. Um, he was admitted to the hospital then for a few weeks. Uh, Ten days later from that last picture is the picture on the left. Um, he started on dialysis. Um, he did not receive any further IO therapy. He had some social reasons which delayed his surgery further until about March 20th. So this was um, almost three months after his or sorry, two months after his last dose of PD-1, and that is his uh, disease status there, and this is what his scalp looked like. Wow. Um, we then decided that we should probably go, and, and, and we had these discussions with him, young man. Yeah, yeah. He did, clearly did not want to go back on dialysis, but also didn't want to die, and we thought that was the best option. Um, we took him to surgery. We did um, a parotid neck and a vastus flap. This man is a large man. Um, so we had to kind of take that into account with the reconstruction options and his other comorbidities. He did well from that. Um, take home point is that right there. Um, he had less than 1% of viable tumor present. Um, and I think we're at about time. We yeah. at this time were so this not is only sure. after two doses of immunotherapy, correct? Two doses of, of, of ipilimumab and nivolumab that was flipped to dosing for the medical oncologist. Um, and I have some questions about this, but we decided at the time to recommend postoperative radiation. We didn't have any data at the time to say that we could forego it. Um, he did complete that. You know, we had a discussion with him about these things. We did not give him any further IO therapy. Um, he completed this uh, recently, and I spoke to him yesterday, and that's how he's doing. 
I see kidney working. Still on dialysis. It's still on dialysis. Okay. Yeah. So even with two uh, doses, makes, the he, kidney. It, yeah, he makes some off. urine, but can, cannot uh, cannot get on dialysis. Interestingly, he's now a little past three years, and is in discussions with his local team to get a new transplant. Oh wow, that's incredible. Well, yeah, I was going to ask, is he? Does he still on um, uh, immunosuppression? Like, what immunosuppression is he on? Yeah, uh, actually, you know what? I'm not sure. So he's probably not any on any right I, now because I, I, yeah, that's, I was going to say. I don't, I don't in think a way he he's is. he's sort of getting immunotherapy. Right. So the question is, you know, it's fascinating. You know, I, I you know, there have been a few cases, not necessarily melanoma, but other cases, because I wonder if. If he does get a transplant and go back on immunotherapy, will that sort of wake back up um, what is probably quiet, quiescent melanoma? So I would, you know, dialysis is a huge ordeal for patients, but I, I would be pretty circumspect uh, before jumping back in to transplant. I, I would personally wait five years, but. Okay, perfect. All right, we got uh, one more case. So I'm sorry, this is- Randy Weber case. agrees with me, that's good. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you so much, Ryan. This was amazing. And hopefully we can discuss these cases again. Uh, if you stop sharing, we can have uh, Caitlin uh, start her, her presentation. And thank Dr. you, Kutalani, I think I had... Go ahead. No, I was gonna say, JJ is, uh, has my slides, fortunately. He's gonna okay. share them for me. All right, good. Um, why Caitlin? Oh, right, Caitlin just started. And uh, we have a cool question from audience about next generation sequencing in these cases when you cannot do routine uh, uh, immunotherapy. Dr. Kushline, do you do routine next generation sequencing? We do. I mean, you may find some rare mutations that potentially uh, may be useful. You know, again, mm -hmm. rarely <clears throat> in track mutation, you could have uh, NTREC inhibitors uh, that may be useful. You could have a P10 mutation where yeah. an mTOR inhibitor may be useful. So oh, on occasion. Perfect. All right, Caitlin, start. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this case actually brings that up a little bit so we can talk more if it's indicated. Um, thank you so much for including me today. I'll, I'll keep the introduction brief, but um, I'm at Moffitt. Um, we have a little bit of a different setup where uh, we have an entire cutaneous department separate from the head and neck and endocrine oncology department. Um, so we tend to see a different uh, pattern of patients. Um, the cutaneous only lesions tend to be um, managed in the cutaneous department and we get mm -hmm. uh, more of the stuff like Ryan was just showing. But this case um, is not quite as complicated, but hopefully brings up some interesting discussion points if we can advance the slides. So it's a 64 year old gentleman who had a painless growing mass. He has a history of working in professional baseball with lots of sun exposure. He's on uh, Prodexa, had um, a history of uh, basic mm -hmm. HIV positive cancer treated with uh, chemo and radiation. It was on the right side. Um, he had a couple of melanomas and squames um, all over, melanoma in side two of the right cheek in 2018, and then another uh, melanoma on the left cheek in 2019. This was treated at an outside institution with wide local uh, excision and uh, a negative uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy. I don't have the full details on the pathology features. He came to me with the parotid mass about um, a few months after that. Okay. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So on exam, his mass was a little bit fixed. It was about four by three centimeters. The skin was not involved. Uh, his cranial nerves were intact and he had no other masses. And FNA showed melanoma. Okay, um, so I assume at this point, you went ahead and got some in the interest of time, let's say, uh, we talked about imaging. So what's, what's your routine casing for these cases? Well, how do you image them? Mm -hmm. So from a surgical perspective, a CT neck with contrast, uh, full distant workup with a PET scan, including a brain MRI. Okay, and what did that show? Just the parotid mass. Um, I believe okay. I have a PET scan image uh, subsequently, if we can show that. Oh, you could see a, a focal, focal lesion there. All right, so advance. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, give me, yeah, let's, let's ask the panel. So Dr. Uh, Bradford, one, you have written quite a few papers on parotid. Mets after melanoma. One focus 
prior history, and this patient did have some radiation to the head and neck, although it wasn't improperized. And now you have a kind of a semi-fixed, you know, sizable mass. How would you control these patients? What's, what's your preferred method? Great question. Thanks so much. And it's an honor to participate in the panel. I, again, out of the gate, and if, um, so a brain MRI is negative. So again, patients have a whole body mm -hmm. CT PET and this parotid cheek mass is the only site of disease. Is that correct? Yes. Mullen? Okay. So um, um, I, I, again, you know, the world has changed. Um, uh, I would always consult with our medical oncologists because immunotherapy plays a vital role in this disease. But, you know, this, um, you know, were we to approach this surgically, uh, the patient would require a parotid and neck dissection. We do work very hard to save the facial nerve. Typically, it's uninvolved except in very extensive cases. And then, mm -hmm. You know, there's the debate between the superficial and total parotidectomy. I don't think that there's a clear answer on that, but you want to, if you're going to approach this surgically at all, uh, you want to make sure you're eradicating uh, the disease in the regional basin completely. So don't, you know, don't, you know, don't leave any disease behind, but I would consult with medical oncology yeah. to also see if there's any clinical trials or, or other recommended treatments. I was going to say, have you have your approach changed nowadays to actually send these patients directly to uh, having immunotherapy, maybe systemic therapy before surgery? Yeah, I think it's always a consultation and a multidisciplinary team. You know, all of these, you know, every every case we've heard today and every case and every patient in real life has a unique story and circumstance. This one... <laughs> This patient's had prior had a neck cancer. Um, the other patient had a kidney transplant. So I think it's always worthwhile to get uh, have a multidisciplinary team to have a conversation yes. about the various treatment options available to the individual patient. It could be surgery and adjuvant <laughs> immunotherapy. So there's many ways uh, to potentially treat this patient. Dr. Weber, what would you uh, recommend for these folks nowadays? Uh, yeah, I, I agree with uh, Carol. Um, we would, uh, I would strongly consider neoadjuvant therapy. I, I think it would be good to also know the BRAF status. And uh, I'm not sure knowing uh, uh, the PDL1 expression uh, is going to be that helpful. I guess our consultant could weigh in on that, but mm -hmm. neoadjuvant therapy first and then surgery to follow. So, Dr. Kashalani, patient comes in with just an FNA. Um, before you do anything, what, how much more information you would require, you would like to know? I think exactly what has already been mentioned, you know, systemic staging as well as molecular profiling, because that will help us uh, direct therapy, particularly if we are considering someone like this for neoadjuvant therapy. And our bias, you know, within our multi-D groups now has been neoadjuvant therapy for clinical or radiographic uh, node positive disease. Mm -hmm. So you would start and do, would you do a uh, one agent, uh, just uh, PDL one treatment or you do? No, we would do a combination. This is based on the Opus and Neo trial from Europe. Mm -hmm. And so we typically would use IP one Nevo three for these patients mm -hmm. between two to four cycles of therapy. If we're going with immunotherapy, mm -hmm. your pathologic response rates are roughly around 60%, 60 to 65% with complete pathologic responses at about 50-55%, which is extraordinarily high. And groups have shown the neoadjuvant consortium that PAT-CR and melanoma to immunotherapy can portend long-term disease control. Yeah. It can also help you risk stratify, risk adapt considerations for adjuvant therapy, but there's very little prospective data to back that up. Trials are currently ongoing. But in those patients who have a PAT-CR, we are very comfortable stopping um, therapy after surgery and not offering any systemic treatment at that point in time. But I think the BRAS is point, critically important as well. Yeah. And at this point, you were comfortable with just immunotherapy and no radiation. Correct. Correct. Okay. Very good. All right. Caitlin, tell us what, uh, how, what did you guys decide? Well, this was two years ago. I think we've mm -hmm. evolved a bit, uh, at least on the head and neck side uh, since then. But um, at the time, uh, it, it was a localized lesion, surgically resectable. So we proceeded with surgery. Okay. Go to the next slide. 
intraoperatively, um, it was found to be sticking to the facial nerve. Um, it was dissected off um, and the branches were preserved. Next slide. The final pathology showed a 2.5 centimeter mass. It had extensive extranodal uh, extension and there was a positive margin along the deep surface. Uh, the rest of the parotid uh, nodal uh, disease was, I'm uh, sorry, uh, nodes were cleaned out and uh, there was a neck dissection performed one through uh, five uh, with 19 nodes left. Okay, Dr. Weber, what would you recommend now? Um, well, when they have extra nodal extension and a positive margin, we would consider adjuvant hypofractionated radiation. But again, I think this needs multidisciplinary discussion. This is definitely a high risk situation. So uh, systemic therapy is also a consideration. Mm -hmm. um, how you would sequence that again, I think is another topic for discussion as well. But this patient is not, not done with surgery alone, I don't think. Yeah. And in these cases nowadays, even when this patient is at this point, is called immunotherapy na naive, uh, would you, would, is that the tumor board, would it be considered just immunotherapy or they would, because of the external extension and positive margin, they still recommend RT? I, I missed the last thing you said. So, so this patient is still immunotherapy naive and never had immunotherapy. Um, even after surgery, would you consider nowadays to just do immunotherapy and no RT, but because does have external extension and is positive margin, you would consider RT in addition to immunotherapy? Yeah, that's a good question, and I don't think we have data to support that one way or another, but um, there is data to, sh to support that post-treatment, post-op adjuvant therapy would uh, at least uh, improve melanoma-free survival, if not overall survival. Very good. Okay. Um, all right, Caitlin. So okay, okay, next slide. Um, so we did have uh, next generation sequencing available for this patient postoperatively. Um, Moffitt Star is our in-house um, tool for that. It was negative for uh, V600E BRAF, but positive for um, a different mutation that turned out to be a class three mutation, not actionable. Um, you can advance the slides. And again. So um, this was what we did postoperatively. He got radiation to the parotid bed alone and um, followed by adjuvant uh, nivolumab with Dr. Kushalani for six cycles. He had uh, side effects with a rash, colitis, uh, some arthralgias. Um, he had some insurance issues as well. So he stopped his treatment after six cycles. And after he started his treatment, actually stopped his treatment, he subsequently developed immune-mediated adrenal insufficiency in AKI. He was put on hydrocortisone. Okay, um, very interesting mm -hmm. case. And uh, But he's doing well from a cancer perspective now. Um, okay. Just recently so, in February, he's NED. Um, hmm. So Dr. Kojolani, what's going on with all these immune-related um, side effects? I mean, obviously immunotherapy is extremely important, but we do see these. Uh, how would you manage these and what, what we as surgeons need to know that? Well, I think it's important. Uh, there, if I had to make just two points, I think number one is this case also illustrates that immune toxicity can develop after discontinuation of therapy. It can be seen as late as six months later. I've seen it almost 12 months later. And recently we got a case that an outside neurologist thought was immune related uh, neurotoxicity, uh, peripheral neuritis, almost five years after stopping ipilimumab. I must admit, I'm not convinced about that at all, but you know, things like that are being reported. I think um, it is really important from a surgical perspective to uh, take into account adrenal insufficiency that is subclinical, particularly in patients who have received neoadjuvant immunotherapy. We have now had more than one case where Immunotherapy has been given, tumor has responded well, patient's gone to the OR, and the next day we are called that patient has crashed, you know, at home or hypotensive, and that has unmasked adrenal insufficiency in these patients, the stress of surgery. So now as a rule, prior to sending these patients to the operating room, I will get an ACTH and cortisol um, at the time that I discuss with the surgeon that the patient is coming back his or her way because I think this is something that, that is real. 
Uh, we are seeing it more and more. And a lot of these patients, you know, even with the neo, with neoadjuvant therapy, 15% of them are developing long-term hypothyroidism. And that is not trivial. So I think we have to be very cognizant um, of utilizing these drugs, which are almost ubiquitous across all of tumor oncology now. Yeah, very good. Excellent point. Um, I have a question Dr. for Will Dr. Kushalani. Uh, Dr. Kushalani mentions, you know, this uh, emerging paradigm now for neoadjuvant immunotherapy prior to surgical resection, which is very exciting. Can you just comment on the uh, reasonable percentage of patients who are non-pathological responders on the pathology report? What do you usually do then? Do you switch if they have a BRAF mutation to, um, you know, BRAF MEK inhibition? Do you switch, you know, LAG3 just came out as a indication. So I'm mm -hmm. just curious what you do for your pathological non-responders in the neoadjuvant setting following surgical reception. I think, I think great question. I think part of it is assessing what the degree of pathologic non-response is. And typically general definitions have been greater than 50% viable tumor in the path specimen. Um, so in those cases, um, one, I would do one of two things, either continue same immunotherapy, which is if I've given them ipi nevo, then I would continue with nevo and finish the balance of what was remaining of one year of therapy. Because typically if this patient had gone to surgery first, I would have given him or her a year of nevo or a year of pembro. That is number one. Number two is for the rare patient that I am seeing virtually no response pathologically. And our pathologists, derm paths are very good at telling us that. Um, those are cases that I would certainly discuss switching to appropriate uh, targeted therapy, specifically dabrafenib plus trametinib as the approved agent in the adjuvant setting. Um, and I would certainly consider that. Is there data to back that up in this setting, switching or risk adaption? No, we are doing a trial where we are conducting six months of neoadjuvant and corafinib and binimetinib for BRAF uh, mutant patients that are resectable. Um, and then at the surgery, risk adapting them precisely to answer your question, if they are a pathologic non-response, randomizing them to six more months of just PD-1 therapy or six more months of encobini to really determine does the adaption um, based on risk improve outcomes. Perfect. Okay, great. Uh, we have two minutes and I would like to ask Dr. Weber and others um, you know, the role of radiotherapy has changed quite a bit in melanoma now with immunotherapy. Dr. Weber, when do you consider in, uh, radiotherapy for melanoma nowadays? You mentioned in this out, uh, external extension post-surgery, anything else? Yeah, well, typically it's for patients with very advanced uh, disease, satellites, um, extra capsular spread, multiple nodes and multiple levels. Um, I'm less certain about uh, you know, sequencing that with immunotherapy. Um, but um, you, the role, the, the benefit, of course, is to improve your local regional control. Perfect. Okay, great. Keep, well, I, you know what? In mind, all three cases. Yeah. These neoadjuvant and adjuvant trials prohibited radiation. So mm -hmm. we don't have that data. You know, we would love to give it, but a lot of these trials specifically prohibited. So we have adverse features in a non-responder that patients on a protocol, we don't know. You can take them off a protocol, but remember the historical data for surgery and radiation before the area of effective systemic yeah. therapy says that 90 to 91% of patients have local regional control. Yeah. Uh, that's hard to beat. Yeah, that's very true. Okay, great. Well, it's eight o'clock now. Eastern time. Thank you so much. This was a fantastic session. Thank you all, Dr. Bradford, Dr. Weber, Dr. Kusholani, Jessica, Dr. Yasvayensky, Kaylee McMahon, and Brian Gifford, and also other experts. Uh, our next session is on May 4th, Source versus Orofaring. Please join us. We are going to have another fantastic session. And thank you so much, Dr. Alice Lynn, for organizing as usual. Have a great night. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.